Good morning to everyone. Today's Boardroom Bites at 9 is on the business judgment rule. Um, this morning we've got a panel a discussion, so again a bit of a different structure, and we will take a little bit longer than our usual um, 10 o'clock end. Um, just to introduce you to our speakers this morning, we have Anton van Beek, who is the chair of our Boardroom um, Governance Forum. He will be facilitating the session. Sorry for that. <laughs> My dogs are busy barking here. We've got Dr. Morris Tembi, Ansi Romalo, and Michael Juden, who's on our panel and is going to share their experiences on the topic. So Anton, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Vicky, and uh, good morning, everybody. It seems the weather is great um, around our country at the moment. Uh, and uh, Vicky, I, I think that's that's what happens on these uh, these virtual events. Uh, we we uh, we do tend to have uh, either the, the leaf blowers going, the guard, your next door neighbour getting the garden or the mower going, and then you have uh, the odd dog barking. So all in a day's work with regard to virtual events. Um, yeah, so just welcome to this, welcome to the, the business judgment guidance paper launch and uh, discussion. Um, as Vicky has said, it is very much a, a discussion and, um, you know, we, we're going to hear from the three panelists shortly on their views, uh, three diverse individuals, but with, with some really good views to share with you. Uh, and then also we're going, to, we're going to be asking them questions. So as Vicky has said, please post your questions on the Q&A, on the Q&A um, Button at the, which is at the base of your screen, um, and uh, we'll we'll obviously then I'll I'll make sure that we get those questions passed around to everybody. Um, just so you know, the uh, the board governance forum we're producing about five or six papers a year. Um, I'll I'll run through this time at the end of the session with you those papers that um, we plan to to produce in the next uh, two two to three months. Um, but this particular paper I think is of of specific interest interest to all of you, um, whether you're executive or non-executive director and the manner in which you exercise your judgment for the best decisions to be taken and, and obviously the courses of action that are available to, to the company in, in this regard. There's no doubt that sometimes these best laid plans fail and in such instances it, it is appropriate that uh, the assessment of those decisions is taken by the directors and not based solely um, on the manner in which the decision decision is is taken or turns out, um, but is based also on the process that the directors followed in arriving at that that particular decision. There's been a lot of debate um, around this this concept uh, and also how it's applied in the courts. There are a couple of very good cases. Centro is is one of them, um, and this paper then really just seeks to provide you and and uh, and the all the constituents. Uh, are the director or non-exec non director um, and others uh, on, on a high level, really a high level overview um, of the rule and looking at some practical considerations. And I think the word practical is, is important here. Um, we've tried to be as diligent as possible in pulling this paper together, but it is, it is principles based and we'll hear from the panelists basically how you should take this paper and, and consider it in your in your day to day. Um, consideration of the materiality of, of decisions that are, are taken. I, um, I also would suggest you understand the act uh, and the bullet point is there uh, and then obviously have a rational basis for believing the decision was in the best interest of the company. So I'm, I, don't, I don't want to take away uh, too much of, the, um, of what the panelists are going to tell you about shortly. Uh, we're going to start off with Mike uh, and then follow, following Mike will be Ansi and then um, and then it, it will be Morris to kind of close off their introductions. And then as I say, we'll go to the question and answers. You'll see on the screen, there is a, you can click there to download the paper. It's also on the IOD's website. I strongly recommend you do that. And obviously look at other, if you don't have the other um, governance forum papers, board governance forum papers, please download those as well. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier on at the close of the session, I will give you an indication as to what to expect in the next couple of months as to the new papers we're going to produce. So Mike, if I can hand over to you for your, your discussion, thanks. Good morning, Anton, um, and to my very good friends, the remainder of the panelists, Ansi and Morris. 
And thank you very much to the IOD for having invited me to sit on this panel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, just before I start, and for those of us who are not lawyers, I think it's very important to understand some of the references which the panelists will be making to the difference between statutory law and common law. So we have two branches of law in South Africa, both feed into the constitution and the constitutional court. On the one side is the statutory law, the statutes of, of parliament, the provincial statutes, municipal, all of the statutory law. On the other side of it, of equal importance is what we refer to as the common law. That's the law which starts like all law with the 12 tables in Rome. And it's the law which has developed in our instance in South Africa, Roman law influenced by English when we were colonized, by Dutch when we were colonized, and also the judgments of the High Court. Neither of those branches of law can be in conflict with the constitution. So as we unfold the business judgment rule today, when we refer to statutory law, that when it becomes codified, part of a statute, and the common law of equal importance is this developing body of law, which is referred to as the common law. Interestingly enough, the, the business judgment rule is a judge-made company law doctrine. And it has been developing for a period of almost 150 years in the United States. It was developed because of the entrepreneurial nature of the US and it was developed to enable directors to make freely decisions which would create a commercially viable country without liability if they'd acted correctly. And most of their cases are heard in the Delaware Chancery Court, which is the court of choice in the United States for matters re relating to the internal affairs of companies. And hardly a day passes that I don't have at least two or three judgments from the Delaware Court dealing with the business judgment rule. For the rest of the world, since the earliest days of company law in the 19th century, judges have struggled with what are the criteria to assist judge, uh, directors who make informed and rational ideas decisions where matters go wrong and to enable them to avoid liability. South Africa was included in that and over time prior to the 2008, 2008 Act, our judges also developed the common law of, in the relating to a business judgment rule. And again, based on directors acting in an informed and rational manner and escaping liability. The watershed came in 2008 when there was a total rewrite of South Africa's corporate law in our terms of our current Companies Act and the business judgment rule has now been codified. It is in the statute, it is part of our law. There is no longer any debate as with, to whether it is part of our common law or not. We joined Australia who have codified their law and Germany who have uh, codified theirs in terms of the G German Stock Corporation Act. So it is now part, as I've said, of our, share, of our statutory law and very much developed by us when we wrote King III, which was released at the same time as the New Companies Act and expanded upon in King IV, which UNSI will deal with later. <clears throat> a lot of the issues relating to the law around business judgment we'll discuss later in question and answer time, but it is very important at this stage just to note that where there has been a breach, 
in terms of a groundbreaking decision of our courts, which is awaiting a final appeal to the Constitutional Court. The court held that shareholders, with some exceptions, can't sue directors. They need to sue the company, and the company in turn needs to sue the directors. If the company refuses to, then under certain circumstances, the claimant can then, the shareholder, can then sue the directors in terms of what is known as a derivative action. Other parties have the right to sue the director um, under Section 2182 of the Act, and there are other bases as well. Um, our business judgment rule is unique in the sense that we expanded it around the world. It relates only to judgments of directors. South Africa expanded it to all decisions of directors. Um, just in closing, our courts have not developed the business judgment rule to the extent that that has been in other countries. I, have, I know that the business judgment rule has been debated many times in private arbitrations, which are confidential, and we have no access to those judgments. But in the recent Dudu Mayani case um, with South African Airways, when she was declared a delinquent director, the business judgment rule was referred to. It's an important case in relation to the business judgment rule, particularly one principle, in, which is now part of our common law, which was set out in that case, is that delegation to a committee does not resolve, absolve the director from their obligations and duties in terms of the business judgment rule. You can only delegate to a committee and not abdicate. The director remains, remains accountable and responsible. And finally, a point which I'm often asked in practice is what other protection does a director have other than the business judgment rule? Well, the business judgment rule is the mother of all defenses. But in addition to that, memoranda of incorporation sometimes provide that directors are indemnified in certain circumstances. But of course, that indemnity is only as good as the company is and then directors and officers liability insurance and for those of you who are involved with directors and officers liability insurance you'll know that it's becoming increasingly difficult to obtain that cover it's becoming very expensive to obtain that cover and the insurers are asking a lot of questions about the governance in the organization they take their checkbook very, very slowly out of their pocket. So the mother of all defenses is the business judgment rule, delivered at no cost in terms of the act. And my compliments to the IOD for making available to the public an outstanding paper. And hopefully our deliber deliberations today will be of assistance. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Mike. Um, just to remind everybody, um, the Q&A box is open at the bottom of your screen. And you'll also note in the, in, the chat, in the chat box, there's also a link. If you haven't managed to download the paper, there is a link there. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ansi now to give us her views, particularly as they relate to the code, King Code. Thanks, Ansi. Thank you, Anton, and good morning to all. And thank, thank you, Mike, for that. Uh, very interesting um, introduction to the topic. Um, the business judgment rule, as you've heard now, has been introduced to re relieve directors from liability in the event that they made errors in judgment. So as Anton has explained, directors are judged then not only uh, or not on the outcome of their decision, which may have been harmful to the company or uh, the company may have, have suffered some losses, but the actions are actually judged on the process that has been followed. And so, but I must hasten to say that this does is, is not tantamount to a get 
out of jail free card. Um, to the contrary, if we go into the requirements um, and the conditions that need to apply for a directors to enjoy this protection, you'll see that the bar is set quite high. So if I can then move on to these conditions, the first is that th uh, the directors must have taken reasonable, diligent steps to have become informed. There, there must not have been a conflict of interest when making the decision, or if there was um, the process as provided in section 75 of the Act must have been followed. And then lastly, the third condition is that they must in the end, so the first step is, is um, taking reasonable diligent steps to become informed. And then in coming to the conclusion in, in the board and uh, coming to its decision, there must be a rational basis established for the belief. In other words, the way that you process the information must have led you to a rational conclusion. And I'm not going to go into detail as far as all of these conditions are concerned. Um, um, I'm sure they'll be covered to an extent by Morris and also in, 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 in the discussions um, subsequent to our introductory remarks. What I thought I would focus on is um, the King Four lens on these conditions. So let me start then with the first condition, namely that directors must have followed reasonable diligent steps to become informed. Now, this should come as no surprise if you link it back to the duties of directors. Um, one of the legs of the duties is um, that uh, directors must act with due care, skill and diligence. Um, and, and this echoes that requirement. If you have regard to principle one of King Four. Um, it says that uh, governing bodies must um, govern ethically and effectively. And if I say it to you, um, some of you may be tempted to say, yes, it's good, we understand it, uh, motherhood and apple pie stuff, let's move on. But 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 let's reflect on it for a moment. Uh, we were very intentional as the King Committee when we decided to define corporate governance as both ethical leadership and effective leadership. Um, and this is something that's been echoed by the Centro case. The directors in the Centro case were found to have acted honestly, in other words, ethically but they were nevertheless found not to have been diligent in the execution of their duties. In other words, not effective. Uh, we saw the same thing um, recently. Uh, some of you may have seen the media coverage of the judgment against um, a the former um, MEC of health in Gauteng, where the high court similarly found that there was no dishonesty or corruption or nepotism on the side of the MEC, but the MEC was nevertheless found wanting in the execution of um, his duties. Um, the, the, the court used very strong language. Um, as, uh, I recall that some of it was that he was deaf and blind to the risks um, that the department faced. Um, during the P PPE procurement process. Um, and, and the reaction of the lawyer of the MEC was very telling because the lawyer then in response to the judgment welcomed the judgment. Um, and, and the fact that the MEC uh, was not found guilty of um, any corruption or nepotism or unethical behavior but, um, um, a, a, and then lamented the fact that the court did not pronounce on the confusion in roles between the MEC and the HOD. Now, now that's very worrying that, th that um, one can think that being found, having been found honest is, um, 
is is the only requirement for for um, executing your duties as a director. And this is what this requirement is um, referring to. Yes, of course, it's it's taken as a matter of course that you you have to act honestly and ethically as a director, but you must also act with diligence. In fact, because you can um, cause harm in not uh, acting diligent, I think that in itself may, may, may point to unethical behavior. In other words, what I'm saying to you, I think being ethical and being diligent are not two completely separate um, subjects. I'm saying that if you do not act with diligence, I think a question mark can be placed behind your ethics. You may have acted with um, uh, without corruption, but have you really acted with um, um, the best intent of the organization? Surely if you do so, you'll be diligent. So, so to step off this, um, Let's see how King 4 has then unpacked what it means to act ethically and effectively. Um, and one of the, the, the characteristics of a director that has been introduced by King 4 is the one of competence. Uh, those of you who know King 3 well, you know that um, there were four principles or characteristics of, of corporate governance in King 3. Um, and we sometimes use the acronym RAF to refer to, to it. Uh, responsibility, accountability, fairness, and transparency. In King 4, we added to this um, competence and integrity. So let's look at competence because competence is what we mean by diligence, right? Um, in King 4, competence is described as that you have to have a working knowledge of the organization that you serve as a director. And this working knowledge is then further unpacked in, in quite some detail um, to say that, that you must understand the organization and its business model. You must understand the industry in which this organization operates. You must understand its economic, economical, its social, and its environmental context and the risks and the opportunities emanating from these. You must understand the six capitals that it's reliant on, and you must understand the laws and the regulations that apply to this organization. So quite an extensive, if you think about how succinctly King 4 is written, quite an extensive um, uh, unpacking of, of what it means to have a working knowledge of the organization. And then another point that is made in King 4 is that it is the director's responsibility to develop this knowledge. And that to me is also very telling um, because I often see in our boards that directors are passive recipients of information. That that is not being diligent. Um, uh, we refer to um, a blue ribbon paper of 2015 issued by the NAC NACD, um, which talks about, and I love this language, we talk, which talks about directors being active students, which talks about directors seeking out information. Um, being an active student and seeking out information um, those two things are the opposite of a passive recipient of information. Um, Bob Garrett um, used to talk about the directors doing their homework, and this is what I think he was referring to, by being an active student and seeking out um, information. The, the other strong linkage to King 4 that I want to point out is... Um, the one that that is um, is 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 uh, when the business judgment uh, rule is described in the Companies Act, um, and when directors are required to first um, uh, obtain all of the reason 
uh, 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 be reasonably diligent in obtaining the information and then um, being able to justify their decision and their belief that it would be in the best interest of the company. The Act then describes um, in which circumstances and um, on which um, persons or parties directors may rely on uh, for their information. And, um, and um, I think that there is a strong linkage between this element and principle 15 of King 4, which refers to um, assurance and the, um, the services, the assurance services and functions that directors um, um, should utilize in order to ensure um, sound decision making is one of the things that are highlighted in that principle. Now, when I explain this to you, I want you to dispense with your attachment to the technical definition of assurance. And here I'm particularly talking to those of you who are chartered accountants and internal auditors, um, because you have specific definitions of assurance. The assurance that we refer to in King 4 is the sources of comfort that you can rely on so that you as a board know that you have um, the right information and that you can rely on this information. And when I train on this aspect, um, I would often say, uh, I would often explain it this way and, 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 and say that as a director, um, where you deal with information that has a high level of risk um, um, involved in it. It's never a good idea to only rely on one source of information. What, what principle of 15 of King 4 has in mind is that you should apply a combined assurance model. In other words, you use various sources and layers of review and oversight to give you um, comfort. Um, so, of course, you will rely on management information, but then the same way as the court will ask you as a director what process you have followed, um, uh, what, which are the diligent steps that you have followed to become informed, I will ask the same of um, management. Um, the CEO, for example, who tables that report, um, I will ask that CEO how she knows um, that this information is correct. And then you must understand then how the information flows up through the organization to the CEO and then to you. In some instances, you may say, management, I am not um, satisfied to rely on only your version of the situation, not necessarily because I think that you are dishonest, but um, we are humans, we are fallible, we all have our blind spots, there is nobody in possession of um, everything that, that, has, uh, that, 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 that is to be known. So in those instances you may call upon an expert, um, you may ask the CEO if there were any dissenting voices uh, within EXCO or senior management, what were those dissenting views? How did you deal with it? Um, um, in, in some instances, of course, uh, uh, th that information must be assured um, in terms of regulation uh, and, uh, and legislation by an external auditor. Um, in some instances, as a director, you will request internal audit to look at a specific area or aspect or piece of information before you make a decision on it. So um, um, this, is, this is just a, to give you a sense of what was contemplated by principle 15, that, that is about combined assurance, and how that fits into the business judgment rule. I just want to conclude with the point that ultimately, of course, it's not a good idea to read the Companies Act in isolation, to read King 4 in isolation. Um, the Companies Act 
looking for your memorandum of incorporation, as Mike has referred to it, your specific industry rules and regulations that, that may pertain to governance, all of these things must be regged and processed and assimilated as a, a package deal when you act as, as a director. Um, as a director, it's your job to make sense um, of complexity. Thank you, Anton. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Ansi, very much. Um, I'm going to hand over, and I see questions are coming in, so thank you for those questions in the Q&A um, tab. I'm going to hand over now to Morris to give us his, his views as well. Thank you. Thanks, Morris. Um, good morning, Anton. Good morning, everyone. Um, I noticed that uh, we have judges that run the risk of being cancelled because they still use words like deaf and blind uh, in a derogatory manner. So hopefully, we can do something to encourage judges to be more aware of their language as they're giving judgments going forward. So it was really interesting listening to uh, both Michael and Ansi talking about really two institutional frameworks that inform our understanding of this concept of business judgment rule. The one institutional concept uh, uh, is the notion of the Companies Act, and the other is, is, um, is the King uh, Commission, uh, the King Report. Um, I, you might have noticed that in my bio that I'm billed amongst others as uh, an interim dean at Gibbs. And so forgive me for doing a quick, uh, providing with a framework that I would like you to yeah. use when you are listening to my case studies that I wanna use to illuminate both my own experience of business judgment, um, as well as my observed experience of others. So if you wish, you can take um, what is embedded in uh, the Companies Act, particularly a section uh, 76.4 of the Companies Act that deals with this concept of business judgment and create a two by two for yourself. So on the one corner is some of the stuff that um, Ansi was talking about, that you need to act with care. And in that corner where we're acting with care, I then also can map this notion of acting with courage. On the other corner, where are we? There we go, that corner there, um, we're saying you need to act uh, with diligence. And, and in that corner, I put in concepts of acting with commitment, showing deep commitment to your job. Then at the bottom here, trying to find my finger, there we go. At the bottom here, uh, in this quadrant, you can put this notion of knowledge where you really need to be very knowledgeable um, about your, your business. And Ansi spoke about having a working knowledge. And then in this corner here, you then can put this idea of experience. In my mind, this is all pulled together by one word that is skill. And I think far too many directors uh, take up, oh, somebody says I must raise my voice. Let me get close to the microphone. Far too many directors take up this concept of being a director when they're actually not skilled to be directors. And if I may give you a warning is that it can be a very expensive appointment. The risk reward trade-off between earning those board fees and the risk that you expose yourself is just not worth it. So allow me to use the first case study being African Bank. I'm a former director of African Bank Investments Limited, ABIL, as well as African Bank Limited, the bank itself. I joined the board in September, 2013, and I resigned from the board alongside my, the rest of my fellow directors in August. Uh, 2014. That's 11 months. Um, and in that 11 months, I earned just under 300,000 Rand in board fees. Because at the time, we were earning annual fees, and you weren't earning attendance fees. So the fact that we actually had over 20 board meetings in that period was irrelevant. 
we were only allowed by shareholders to earn the board fees that had been authorized. And that was just under 200, uh, 300,000 Rand for me. In the process of the bank failing, um, together with my colleagues, I was exposed to a 2 billion Rand lawsuit. So I think you need to understand reward, 200, 300,000 Rand, risk, 2 billion Rand. The, there is no mathematics that says, given the risk of being sued for 2 billion Rand loss, you should accept 200,000, 300,000, a million Rand board fees. Um, so I think please be aware when you're accepting those board fees, what might sit on the other side of that equation, right? Fortunately, all, all is well that ends well. So I still have my home. I still have my shirt. My children still can go to school because at the end, this is the, herein lies the rub. The facts speak. So Ansi spoke about multiple choices and these multiple sources rather, where you need to be mindful of the law, the common law, the Companies Act. You need to be mindful of the various codes Etc. taking an integrated view. I want to add a, an additional dimension, which in my view is of equal import. And that is this notion of facts. And those of us that are not lawyers actually underplay how important the facts are in enabling you to demonstrate whether you fulfilled your duties under this notion of business judgment rule. So remembering my framework, on the one hand, you've got care, you've got commitment, you've got diligence, and the other, you've got experience and you've got knowledge. And then in the middle, you've got this notion of skill. What really helped me in two spaces at the African bank environment is when appearing in front of the commissioner, uh, uh, advocate John Myberg, who asked us, how did we make certain decisions within African Bank Board? How could we have made decisions that exposed the business to risk? And even when we knew that it, we could have made alternative decisions. So my response, let me give you a specific case study on this one, is that the one particular point that the commissioner, advocate Myberg, was really interested in is that in around June, a month before African Bank went bankrupt or went into curatorship, um, we authorized a payment of a loan to Ellerines, and Ellerines being a 100% subsidiary of ours. And the authorization of this loan was informed by a need to keep Ellerines afloat. And so it, it can have, um, it can continue operating. Had we not done that, at that date in June, Ellerines would have gone down. And then also African Bank at that point would have gone down. Um, what we were able to demonstrate, some of us in any event, to the commissioner was that we kept detailed notes of our discussions. We could refer to those notes in terms of my notebook, not just the minutes produced by the, uh, the company secretary. We then could explain our rationale we could explain our understanding of the financial position of the bank at that time, the financial position of the subsidiary of the bank holding company. We could explain all the other information we had at our disposal. And we could then demonstrate that we believe that the decision we took at that point was rational having regard to all the facts. And then we were able to say to the, to the commissioner, 
that it is one thing after the fact to question the sequence of events, i.e. to question the facts, and then to rearrange those to suit a particular narrative. However, when you are in the moment, as long as you can demonstrate that you are knowledgeable, you have the experience, you have the skill, you have done your due diligence, and you have taken a courageous decision with care and concern um, to arrive at a decision which integrates, which resolves these dilemmas, that to the best of your belief at that point in time, to the best, best of your informed knowledge, knowingly taken, diligently taken, at that time, this was the right decision. The fact that subsequent to that, other events came and interrupted that, and your decision was found to be wanting, does not change that at that point in time, that was the right decision. And I'm happy to say I can stand today and say that explanation was accepted by um, former judge Myberg, advocate Myberg, and for that reason, uh, I was um, presented in a positive light in the, in the commission report. Likewise, you might want to ask, how do you acquire this knowledge? Of course, you acquire this knowledge partly because you bring it, partly because of your practices, but also partly because of how you are inducted into your organization. So I'm now a, a non-executive director at Investec Bank. I'm told I'm one of the few directors that has faced a commission of inquiry, then get approved, if not the only one, get re-approved to be a director of a bank, right? Um, and and the pleasure of being part of Investec Bank is that they put you through an extensive induction program, number one. Two, you are given access to unlimited amounts of information and people without having a need to mediate that through the CEO or the CFO. In fact, there's a deep understanding that as a board member, as a non-executive, you ultimately are accountable even though the management is responsible. So understanding our relationship and then creating this culture of transparency and openness is a crucial component of how you acquire this knowledge, right? Um, and then if I can conclude with what I observed in a case study that is soon to be published that my colleagues and I wrote on the fallout between Old Mutual, former Old Mutual CEO and the board, is that knowing that um, the, the CEO, the then CEO had exposed the board to risk, had the management, had the board not taken the difficult decision to part ways with the former CEO and taken decisions which would have visited negative consequences to Old Mutual, they could not rely on the business judgment rule because they would already have broken that chain by staying in a relationship with the former CEO. So in other words, sometimes when we are observing stories that are told about the roles and responsibilities and activities in the media about directors, we, it is told in a way that doesn't give you full credit to the facts and how those facts are unfolding and how the directors are applying the amount to those facts. And so for me, um, I think it's really important to be mindful of the institutional mechanisms. Like I said, the Companies Act, the King Codes are equally important to listen to the facts because the facts speak a thousand, a thousand words. And, and what's really important is that you then must know that you are very knowledgeable, you're very experienced and very skilled. And if you not go out there and invest in acquiring that knowledge and that experience before you take up your role as a director. And uh, let me stop there. There's another case I want to refer to at a future date, which really 
uh, I think had I known this case beforehand, I would have done this, what I, my practice is a lot more uh, seriously. But knowing the outcome of the 2020 case, I'm now even more determined that at every board meeting, the practice of taking my own notes, keeping my own minutes are really important. And so before I hand over back to you, Anton, there's a case written about the um, Af African Bank case study written by a Harvard professor, Professor Lynn Payne. You can find it from Harvard themselves. You, I think you can acquire it for about $4 or $5. And then the own mutual case will soon be published also on a similar platform written by myself and my colleagues at Gibbs. Um, and so we are about two to three months away from publication date. And once that comes out, I'm very happy to communicate to the IOD to share the information of those cases. Thank you very much. Over to you, Anton. Thanks, Morris. Uh, and thank you very much for your, your open-hearted discussion this morning. Uh, and we certainly look forward to the old mutual case, uh, case, well, case study that you, you're putting together with your colleagues. Um, I am going to go now to, to the question, question session. Um, I do see there's quite a few questions in the Q&A, so I'm not, I was going to do a little summary, but let's rather go to the questions and we'll do the summary at the, at the end. Uh, just to thank the three panelists for, for setting up this discussion, uh, and you have certainly prompted a number of, of, of uh, really good questions. One or two of them are linked, um, but I'll start with those who posted their questions first, and uh, I'm just referred to you in your, by your first names, you'll know who you are. Um, there's a question here from Mark with regard to business rescue and liquidation, uh, and what are directors' potential liabilities in these instances? And I wondered, Mark, if you would be able to um, give us your view on that. Thank you, Anton, and hello, Mark. Um, it's to be brief, so we could deal with a lot more questions. There is an absolute obligation upon the directors when having taken all diligent and reasonable steps, uh, having used the solvency and liquidity test, when it becomes apparent that the organization is no longer, in accounting terms, a going concern, there's an absolute obligation to apply for business rescue if there is a prospect of success as a result of a moratorium, failing which the directors must immediately apply for the liquidation of the company. Failure to do so will result in the directors attracting personal liability jointly and severally unlimited for all of the obligations of the company. So using language which both Morris and, um, and Ansi have used about acting ethically and effectively, effectively, you should at all times be aware that the organization meets the solvency and liquidity test. That's the statutory test, the, the accounting test of a going concern, failing which you must apply, as I've said, for business rescue or liquidation in order to avoid personal liability. Thanks, Anton. Thank you, Mark. I'm going, to, I'm going to go to two questions from Lolita and Deirdre, who reference uh, board minutes. And um, there's the, from, from uh, Lolita asking, you know, obviously the tendency for boards to record decisions only. Um, shouldn't this process discussion to arrive at these decisions also be reflected in the minutes? And then equally, uh, Deirdre has, has asked, um, can we please talk a little about board minutes? Uh, and she says that she's seen uh, some being so high level, it's difficult to determine what conversation occurred. So, can I, um, yeah, can I, can I ask uh, Ansi, Would you mind picking up that that particular question? Uh, those are very um, pertinent observations by Lilita and Deirdre, and um, uh, that speaks to the um, use of. Um, this legal provision to, to guide you in not only your decision making, but how you manage your decision making. Because uh, if, if th these are the legal requirements, you must be able to evidence this legal requirement. And yes, um, 
uh, there will be board members who will be diligent enough to make detailed notes, as, as, as you've referred to, um, Morris. Um, but th the formally correct way to go about it, um, the, the notes by the directors should be the fallback position. But um, the ideal formal way to deal with this is to, um, to uh, minute correctly. And so for this reason, I disagree with just minuting a resolution. You have to minute, firstly, the information, the steps that you followed um, to become um, informed. And then secondly, what information you relied on. And thirdly, um, as part of your explanation of the resolution that was taken, you must um, explain the rationale for your decision um, so that you can refer back to it um, subsequently. I think that is a very um, important point. And that is why um, your company secretary needs to be senior enough so that she can follow the discussion um, so that she is able to extract the pertinent points from the discussion. I have to say that on many boards, I see that directors see the, the approval of the minutes almost like an administrative thing. And if you don't have the right company secretary, it can become very time consuming to, shall I say, fix the minutes so that they do um, have all of these elements included in the decisions that are taken. Um, but uh, minutes are hugely important um, when, it, when it comes to um, um, you have, as a board having to um, justify um, your decisions and the process that you followed to reach those uh, decisions. Thanks, Anton. Thanks, Martin. Maybe link to Anton, Anton uh, uh, can I come into that as well, though? Go, go Morris. Just to give a pragmatic, so, you know, <laughs> some board meetings are very long. And um, I can only speak about my experience in banking and insurance boards, and some of the issues can be very complicated. So some pragmatism is required um, in that you can really have the one extreme, which I think Ansi is talking about, where people just record a decision and no context. Um, uh, the other could be on the other extreme where you give a lot of information and you just get lost in the story. It's like a novel. <laughs> right? um, and, 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 and what is actually required is something more in between. And, and what I found is what really works well is if it's a non-contentious decision, it's okay to say a discussion was held on this issue and this decision was taken. But when it is a contentious decision and there is differences of opinion, it's actually important to record that a discussion was held, some directors held position A and others held position B. And specifically, this particular director had a dissenting voice. All right? and, and particular dissenting voice people need to be named. That's what I would advise. Now, Again, coming back to the African bank case, um, we were asked on, on different issues to say, when this was discussed, what was your view? I said, commissioner, please go to the minute and you will see that I dissented. And therefore uh, you can't say the board as a whole acted in this way. You can say, what did you Morris do? Um, and, and did you just nod or did you disagree? And did you express your disagreement? And and because remember, you can't also as a board member, how can I say, hold the board to ransom and be reckless on the other hand. Uh, so you can say, members, we can make this decision to go ahead, but please, I want it to be noted that I did not support this decision. So very important to be pragmatic about those issues. Um, and then also then maybe on the fallback point that you are making, Ansi, um, Anton, I, I do want to refer to me on this issue of fallback minutes to the, uh, the Newton case. I think the, the, the gentleman's name is John Dennis Newton, who was the former CFO, former financial director of CNA, 
He was sued in 2007 for reckless trading. He was the only director that was sued. And the only reason he was the only director that was sued is because he had personal liability insurance. The other directors did not. Sued by the liquidators. The case was only settled finally in 2020. Case number 562-09, right? So there's two problems there. One is taking them like almost 13 years to resolve this matter. <laughs> But this man's life just stood still. That's another consequence. Way before we work out, as it happens, he won, right? <laughs> but it took him 13 years of his life to win, right? Um, his career took a standstill. Secondly, how did he win? He said, yes, the minutes say whatever, but here's my detailed notes. And based on my detailed notes, I can show you that I was applying diligence, and care, and I was using my skill at every decision. The fact that the decision turned out to be wrong after the fact does not mean my decision to support it ex ante was incorrect. And the judge agreed with him. So the judge says, you need to be able to demonstrate either in the formal minute or in another secondary minute that you have exercised your business judgment. Now, of course, the Newton case had nothing to do with the business judgment rule per se, because it was pre-2008, but it had a lot to do with how do you evidence your diligence. Thanks, Anton. Thanks, Morris. I think some, some, uh, some really good points there. Um, I'm going to actually ask, I'm going to stay with you if you don't mind, because there, there, there are two questions linked to what you've just said. And um, one was around the dissenting director from Namo, and, and I... I uh, just want to refer to the dissenting director paper. So if, if you want to get hold of that paper, please go onto the um, IOD's website and under the board governance forum, you'll pick that paper up. Um, but um, the question really is around understanding and you, you've mentioned it now on, on uh, board members bound by the decisions taken by the board, but then how does a dissenting, how does a dissenting director or how does dissenting help a director in, in this regard? And why are you thinking of that? It was interesting, you, you mentioned um, the, the minutes and your meetings and how long they are on financial services. Sharon also makes a point here that shouldn't um, directors get hold of the meeting recordings to support the compilation of those minutes and obviously then you know, derive from that your own minutes. But I'd imagine if your board meeting is as long as it is to go through that recording is gonna take even longer, but, but interested to know your views or hear your views on sure. that. Certainly. So um, in terms of dissenting, now Michael can correct me here because he's the lawyer, I'm not, but my legal advice in the various litigations I've been through over the past five years informed me that there's a misconception in amongst directors that directors are jointly and severally liable, right? That in fact, in law, directors are not jointly and severally liable. You are liable individually as a director for your actions and non-actions, right? You can expose yourself to risk by virtue of maybe being um, in a board with unscrupulous people, but ultimately it's still your actions and your decisions. And so against that background, what I understood some of us had done in the various boards which provided us with the necessary protection is that it, whilst the board as a whole is accountable and will be held accountable for the decisions of the board as a whole. However, the degree of accountability will be moderated by individual uh, activities. So a dissenting director will say, First, you are caught in the broader net of your director and a decision was made and you were part of that decision. However, there's a get out of jail free card and that get out of jail free card is how you exercise your dissent. And it's not enough, for example, just to, dissent, to be a dissenting voice um, in the board meeting if there's another opportunity for you to be a dissenting voice beyond the board meeting. So for example, coming back to banking, Let's imagine that I'm part of a bank board that is behaving poorly and I'm dissenting. I also then have an obligation to go to my regulator 
and to express my dissent to my regulator. So in other words, did I do enough? Did I really express my dissent authentically and fully? Of course, the net effect is should I remain as a board member? Chances are the answer is no, I should resign. But in the process of resigning, I need to, remember in resignation does not stop me from the liabilities from following me. So I need to make sure that if I want to make sure there's no liabilities that follow me, I need to exercise my dissent completely, right? So for me, this notion of dissenting director is really important and in, in boards that I've been part of has been respected and taken seriously. And in fact, in boards that I'm part of, when you dissent, a, a specific attention is given either to slow down the conversation, to incorporate the dissenting director, and if we're not able to, to record in detail the reasons why the director dissented and actions taken to counterbalance that view by the majority that don't agree with that. So that a reader of that minute is able to make up their own mind that this dissenting director was given voice, their views were taken into consideration, but the majority still felt differently. So I hope that answers my views. We can spend a lot of time, and I think your paper that you're referring to, Anton, I think I read it about a year or so ago, if not two years ago, is a very good paper that illustrates um, some of the intricacies of dissenting directors. And the second point then, just remind me, Anton, what was that about? I'm just, I got carried away talking. It was just on the, uh, on the recording of, of uh, yeah. minutes and yeah. directors so getting on that one, For me, it's this, my interest in, in board governance is around the relationship of trust with the role of trust. Ultimately, the recording is there um, and it differs from company to company about how you treat recordings, how long you keep recordings for. Uh, and, and, and some boards, the recording is, is kept until the minute is approved. And once the minute is approved, the recording is destroyed. Um, uh, and this is done for legal protection reasons because oftentimes in minutes, you say stuff loosely, like, um, and, and you don't want those kind of issues to be, to be used against you in the wrong place. And so personally, I think if you're a director and you're not happy when the minutes are brought to you for approval, that's when um, you should re rely on the recording to sense check what was said. But post that, in my view, pragmatically, beyond that, it doesn't add a lot of value for each director to go and listen to five hours of minutes uh, in a recording. I think we need to apply some pragmatism in some of these issues. And also we need to trust that we've got good management. We need to trust that we've got a good company secretary. Ultimately, structures and the law aren't gonna fix everything. At the end, we need to be good human beings as well to be good directors. Great, Morris, thank you so much. And Mark, I'm gonna go to you now. I, I, don't, I, you know, I would like you to, to share your views um, on what, what Morris has said as well. Um, but also whilst you're sharing those views on, on dissenting directors, um, I'll just have a question here from, from Eb, Abraham. Uh, in the, he says, in the Centro case, the director signed off the AFS classifying short-term debt as long-term debt, which resulted in the company getting into trouble. Could this conduct be regarded as having not acted honestly? I.e. the statement today that um, they did not, obviously. And uh, as it appears, no further inquiries were made. Uh, his view is it's a major breach of their fiduciary obligations. Um, thank you, Anton. Just uh, going back quickly on the minutes, I thought ANSI dealt with that point very well regarding the importance of a company secretary. Um, I think one of the things which inexperienced directors often believe is that when the minutes are sent to them for perusal before they are put for at the next meeting for adoption, is that it's a second bite at the cherry. I can have a look what I said and say, oh, I don't like that. So change it. It, it, don't, it ain't the position. Once you've said it, you've said it. It has to be recorded what you said. The best you can do is to ask that to be put as an agenda item at the next meeting for you to explain. But when you get the, meet, the minute meetings to check for accuracy, it's not a second chance to put right what you said, which was wrong. Um, so careful 
um, with what you say at board meetings. Think. The second point is to Morris's point of those handwritten notes. I absolutely agree with him, but I also just want to sound as a lawyer a note of caution. We are currently involved in a very big competition commission case. The handwritten notes are of critical importance and the author of those notes is under extreme attack by us because he's unable to, to show that they were contemporaneously made and that they're not an afterthought. And a lot of people create these notes post the event so that for the benefit of that exact science of hindsight, they can fall back on the notes. If you've got notes, make sure that there is some external evidence which you can use to show that they were contemporaneously made, that they are in fact notes that were made at the meeting and be very careful that you actually want those notes to be subject to cross-examination. They notes that are made very quickly, scribbled, and often they can come back to bite you. They aren't always the silver bullet. So I think we need to always bear in mind uh, Malcolm Gladwell and the blink moment. And when before you speak, think. Um, the reason why the Lord gave us two ears and only one tongue. The, um, as far as the lab, joint and several liability is concerned, um, the fallback position is that the directors are jointly and severally liable, but the court has the power in terms of the act to release a director from that liability on application. So the default position joint and several, but the dissenting director using all of the principles which have been so eloquently made by Ansi and by Morris would enable a director on application to be released from the joint and several liability. I remember being overseas in those distant days when we were allowed to travel without our faces covered. Um, a director in Germany told me, always think of the board of director as you're all on a rowing boat together. If one director decides that he or she is tired of life and takes out a drill and drills a hole under them to sink, the whole boat sinks. So remember when you're sitting in that board, the collective. Be very, very careful to ensure that where you disagree where you don't believe it is a, a rational and reasonable decision, that it's perfectly clear so that you can get this get out of jail card on application to be relieved from the liability. The Centro case um, in, uh, I remember when a, a, a lawyer in Australia who I've done do a lot of work with called me when the live feed was coming through in his office as the judgment was being delivered in what is affectionately or disaffectionately, depends what side you're sitting on, the Centro case was being delivered. And Unsi particularly will remember, it sent a shudder through the halls of the corporate world. Because up until then, directors sat in board meetings, particularly when dealing with the financial aspects. The chair of the audit committee presented the committee, the dealt with the, uh, the annual financial statements and asked if everybody's approved and everybody put up their hand and said we approve. In Centro case it became apparent that many of those directors had no clue about finance. They were on that board for other skills and because the chair of the audit committee said it was okay, they were okay, said it's okay. And Mervyn spoke to, uh, to us throughout all the iterations of King, as Ansi knows so well, telling us about intellectual honesty. And they were intellectually dishonest. They committed fraud when they said yes, because the truth of it was it wasn't their yes. They blindly said yes because the chair of the audit committee said yes. 
So the statement should have showed, I haven't a clue what he was talking about, but I trust John. So I said yes, because John said yes. That would have been honest. So what the Centro case showed us in one of the most critically important corporate law judgments, corporate lawyers have that case and those the wonderful words of some, some of the words the judge has used in that judgment, always at hand is that you need, as Ansi said and repeatedly told us when she was our task team leader and we were writing King for, you need to have an understanding of all aspects of the business. You need to be able to interrogate with an understanding, questioning, intelligent and honest mind, all of the decisions. You may not be able to, you don't have to be able to prepare the annual financial statements but you need to know enough that when you say, I approve, I approve. And I just want to conclude on that with what has become perhaps the most critically important issue of all in the boardroom. We live today in a digital world. The empirical evidence shows that more than 80% of board directors globally are digitally unintelligent and incompetent. Yet they sit in board meetings and approve budgets involving digital spend, how the, the company pivoting into digital areas, and they keep approving something that they have no clue about. The people in their household who understand the digital world, they dropped at school that morning. And they then, using trust money, because it's shareholders and lenders' money, make decisions. So it's vital as we move into this new world, this digital world, the directors are digitally competent and are able to ask the right questions in the new world. And to end that point, uh, when I'm asked about, but what do we do if we don't understand it? One of the important things which I'm sure will come up this morning is the importance of the board pack, the board pack being prepared by competent preparers and you're questioning things in the board pack and always approaching the chairman for the ability to approach at the cost of the company an outside expert to explain anything to you that you don't understand before you go into that boardroom and vote. And all of these things are critical because perhaps for me, the most important thing that's been said today is what uh, Ansi's point, when those DNO insurers come to have a look, when the shareholders or other stakeholders sue, they're going to want to know what was the process to come to that answer. So be, we must be very careful. And then just one last thing on John Newton's case. I think the most important thing of that case was the D, that that DNO insurance didn't only cover a, a damages award against him, but it covered his defense costs. He could never have run that case for 10 years with the enormous, exorbitant legal costs, but for the fact that I won't mention the brokers because I'm one of their panel attorneys, but they'd provided in the policy for defense costs and they picked up all of the costs of that 10 years of litigation. So remember that you, if you're going to defend something, it costs money to def defend. Make sure that your DNO insurance covers defense costs. I hope I've an answered the question, Anton. Thanks so much, Mike. You certainly have. And um, just a, an interesting point you made at the end around the board pack. I mean, there is a section in the paper that speaks directly to meeting information minutes uh, board pack. So it, it'll be good for all of you to reference that as well. Um, Ansi, I want to ask you a question. And just, just so everybody knows, I'm trying to get through all these questions. I'm sort of moving up and down now through them just to get uh, one or two of them answered at the same time. Um, there are quite a few. I see we still have 12 unanswered questions. I'm hoping that we will get through all of them. Uh, but Ansi, from, uh, from Walter, Walter asks, that, is there something akin to the business judgment rule that would apply to an organ of state a creature of statute, uh, and if not, should there be? And if so, how, how should that be applied and how effective do you think it would be? 
So, um, Anton, the short answer is no, but the longer answer is, of course, that um, that the courts are are using um, external standard to understand what is due diligence, what it. it let me take one step back. So for most state organs, state entities, if you look at the PFMA, um, the accounting authority, um, which is tantamount to the board, um, and where it's not a company, the company's act is not applicable, um, but uh, this you, you find similar provisions in the PFMA, for example, um, on the duties of the accounting authority um, of um, a state-owned entity. So um, it's also acting in good faith, acting in the best um, interest of the entity, acting with due diligence. Those, they sometimes said in different terms, but um, that's encapsulated in um, PFMA and sometimes in the um, enabling legislation of the entity. Now, the legislation addresses it at a high level. It may say something like, you must act with due diligence. But to give it content, the courts are referring to um, King 4, uh, for example, to say, well, the King 4 or King 3 or King 2, depending on what, what was relevant at that stage, establishes the standard for director's conduct. And so director's conduct um, would then be measured against King 4 to say, um, whether directors did act with due diligence. Now, the business judgment rule is not a part of uh, King 4 in the sense that we've repeated it or articulated it separately, but you can clearly see in the writing of King 4 that it's um, implied in King 4. And I do think that because the business judgment rule is part of our common law, as Michael has pointed out, that the, the, the um, th that judges will um, reference at least the spirit of it um, when um, assessing uh, um, an accounting authority's uh, behavior, and in some instances, the accounting officer's um, behavior. So it, there's no direct link, but I believe that there is an indirect link. Thanks, Nancy. So well, I've and got you uh, come in on yeah. that. Quickly. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, whilst we were writing King Four, um, one of the professors called me one day and said to me, asked me how it was going, and uh, I said it was going very well, but Ansi was a ruthless taskmaster and we were exhausted. And um, she said, well, it must be particularly difficult for you with King being part of the common law and therefore binding to make sure as you write King for, because you can't change the law, that what is already part of the law. And I asked her what she meant. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we've got limited time. I spoke to Mervyn and said, Mervyn, do you know that there are already, I think at that stage, there were eight or nine judgments, as Ansi's correctly pointed out, where the judges have used king and because judgments of the high court become part of the common law and the common law is binding, king is part of the common law. And I mentioned it to Mervyn, I regretted doing that because he said, well, then you do the research and write a paper, um, which I did and he peer reviewed and it was published. If anybody's interested, I'm happy to share it with them. My email address is on the uh, chat. And, the, and what that, paper does it refers to the what ANSI's just said how the courts use King as the standard and in fact for those of you who were at the launch of King 4 you'll remember the Chief Justice in his address actually spoke about how King has become part of the common law and he referred to two or three judgments in his address of the Santon Sun that morning where the court had used King so ANSI's made a really important point is that, and you can see after you've read the paper, if you agree or not, that King may not only just be a voluntary and aspirational code, but it may now be part of South Africa's common law.
Thanks, Anton. Thank you, Mike. Um, maybe just back to Ansi. I was going to ask you a question from uh, Reshmili was, uh, do these principles and rules apply to prescribed offices? So I wonder if you can answer that for us, Ansi. Yes, yes, indeed it does. Thank you. I, I knew you'd have a quick and succinct answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so just moving on now to one or two of the other um, questions. I think some of these have been answered, but I'm going to just ask uh, from, uh, from Marius. Uh, Marius asks, where does a business judgment rule fit in where a single director continues to act in the best interest of the company while he or she has been held accountable for previous board actions or non-action? And where, when is it time to go rather than acting in the best interests of the company? Um, so maybe I think Ansi, I'm sure you've got a view on that. Then I'm also going to ask Morris to to back up that uh, that question as well. Um, th thank you, Anton. So, so just to get back to the joint and several liability and the misconception Morris was referring to is that there's a blanket, um, um, uh, you know, you can be blank, you know, held liable. Um, just by virtue of the fact that you are um, a director or an officer. Uh, but that is not the case. You can only be held liable for your actions. There, there are various elements that go into holding a person civilly liable. Um, the, the, the one is that you must have performed the actions. So Marius, if you weren't involved in performing the action or making the decision, there's no ways that you can be held liable. And then secondly, you must have been found um, um, guilty of acting either um, uh, in breach on purpose or um, through negligence. Um, and, and there are a couple of, there must be causality and, and which I'm not going into because this is not a legal lecture, but um, so, so there's not like you have a blanket liability. So Marius, if you weren't, if you weren't involved in um, making that decision or in that action because it was done by the previous board, then the current board can't be held um, liable. What could happen is that the way that you then deal with the errors committed, if that's the case, by the previous board, if you do that negligent, if you, you respond to that negligently, but that's then a different cause of, of action. So, um, yeah, I know we're running out of time, so let me, let me stop there. Anton, I think uh, Ansi has done an excellent job in answering that question directly. Uh, so I don't have anything specific to add to that. I might maybe made a tangential point because I think when I listen to Marius's question, there's two elements to it. There's the legal question, which Ansi has responded to. Then there's the relational uh, aspect. And that relational one is if you are, you believe you're the only director that is always acting in the interests of the board and all the other, of the company, sorry, rather, and all the other directors are not. Um, I think that there's a message there for you that you keep staying in that board will expose you to risk. You should actually leave um, because, and that's also a message. And in your resignation, you should state your reasons for leaving because you are alerting others as to why you are leaving, that you don't believe your peers are acting in the interest of the company, right? And so I think for me, after all the legal stuff is said and done, there's still the practical stuff of what are you gonna do as a human being in that context? And, and I think for me, it's important that don't stay in that board for those board fees, because they're not worth it if you are in a board with people who don't share the same values as you, who are not acting with the kind of integrity and courage required to be acting in the interests of the company. Remember, and I'm sure Michael will make this point, we are not appointed to act in the interest of any particular stakeholder, i.e. shareholders, for example, we are appointed to act in the interests of the company as a whole. Anton, can I just, yep. just underline, yep. if I could just quickly underline what Morris has said, it's absolutely correct with respect. Can we just so that all of the, none of the delegates 
um, there's no misunderstanding. Unsi made a critical, critical point about directors. There's no absolute liability. When we say directors are liable, Unsi correctly made the point, you still have to find them liable. They aren't just liable by virtue of their office as a director. That's an absolute liability. You do sometimes find it in statutes and some environmental statutes where there's absolute liability, where you're liable just by virtue of the office you hold, uh, occupational health and safety in those areas. Unsee made a very important point, and I really think it's important people don't leave with the wrong impression. When we talk about directors being liable, jointly and severally liable, you still have to find that they are in breach and that they are liable. So there's a hurdle to go, to jump over before you get the, the, that liability. Thanks, Mike. And, and maybe just back to Morris and uh, quick question. Before I say that, I have noticed some hands up. Um, so I will hope we'll hopefully get to those hands up uh, shortly. There are still quite a few questions on the uh, Q&A that we need to get through, but uh, let's hope we get those, those individuals with their hands up. Uh, Morris, just on from, from Muketi, um, you know, if the company deems the DNO insurance not feasible due to costs, directors are then left vulnerable to litigation should the company sue them pursuant to shareholders' actions against the company. You had a couple of comments on that earlier. I wonder if you had anything further with regard to this specific uh, question. I agree with what Mukherjee is saying. I would never join a board without DNO insurance as a rule. And I think if you're on a board and there's no DNO insurance, please resign immediately. Uh, and because you just, it's like uh, jumping out of an airplane without any, any protection. So it's really, this, the, it will be the most stupidest thing that you've done to date. So just don't do it. Um, the only other comment I can make around directors and officers insurance, all the points that Michael made are really important to make sure that not only um, do you have cover in case you're found liable, but you also need to have cover for legal costs. And what I also learned in the African bank case, make sure that you buy additional cover for reputational protection um, because uh, it's available. Many of us don't buy it. And if you don't buy it, that also can be quite expensive um, to protect your reputation during this period. Uh, it's really important. Thanks, Anton. Thanks, Morris. I'm going to go to one of the, um, and the two people with, hand, with their hands up, uh, Paco. And I, I'm just not sure now if, Vasani, um, if we've got to get you to, to un- we go. Well done. Okay, so Paco, if yes. you want to ask a question. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. You people are psyching us up. Um, there's a question on this uh, minutes. It's a very worrying uh, issue. Now, can, can we suggest, just asking you, can we suggest that we have a process where we have a resolution and lock it, where we say, after the meeting, let's all of us look at the, the, the minutes quickly within a week and close them at that end to avoid forgetfulness and then those afterthoughts. And then we go and spend small amount of time in the boardroom rather than go and some people even come and discuss semantic uh, issues in English and all that. Because some of the things are not done maliciously, the afterthought sometimes is through forgetfulness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Paco. Um, maybe Ansi, do you want to pick up that one on the um, getting through those minutes in a, in a sort of a, uh, an ex uh, and I see Morris also wants to say something. So Ansi mm -hmm. and, and then Morris. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very good suggestion to uh, complete the minutes as soon as possible. The other um, um, useful uh, practice to adopt uh, and and I'm not sure that too many boards have a handle on that is is to save the minutes and the board pack together to make sure that they are because your board pack automatically includes then what um, 
what was considered, uh, what pro information was considered um, as part of the decision. And that means you being saved from repeating um, all of that in, in your minutes. But definitely to complete it as soon as possible and um, very important for all board members to actively participate in making sure that the, the minutes correctly and completely. And here I also take Morris's point that you shouldn't go into an inordinate amount of detail, just succinctly, um, um, uh, you know, all of the material points, uh, but all of the directors to be involved in that process. Thanks, Auntie. And uh, Morris, anything further to add to that? I don't know if the you only were... comment is maybe is a, is a tilt towards Michael Juden when he spoke about digital intelligence. Uh, we are all sitting at home right now using a Zoom platform. Uh, and, and I think th there's a lot that technology can do to help us in this regard. And so maybe building also what Ansi is saying, if you use uh, platforms like Microsoft Teams, where you can open channels and you put all the documents in one place, and, and you are able to cross-reference or maybe even a board, uh, a, a board platform, like I think we use Did Diligent. So if you can use those technologies more effectively, it can also help you to make sense of what's happening. And, and Michael, in fact, when you're talking about making notes on, on these Diligent platforms, uh, in each of the board items, you can actually make notes and it gives you a digital stamp <laughs> of what was said at that particular point. So it's very effective. And I think for me, and you can always refer to those notes as part of your minute taking. So I think using technology to help you to make sure you get appropriate accurateness is really important. And I think there might be a paper there for, for, for the governance <laughs> forum here to please consider in terms of how to use digital technologies to enable appropriate record keeping and accountability. Well, you, you'd be happy to know we have Sharon Carson on this on this call, and we're looking at a digital governance paper. We might need to add a few extra pages, Morris. But maybe while you while you're still chatting, um, your experience in organisations uh, assisting board members and directors to become skilled in using those those platforms. Do you think that uh, that's an area that needs to be sort of taken on by the by the organisation, or do you think they leave it very much up to up to the individual directors to get to get skilled in using those 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 digital platforms. I think it's a system problem. It's not an individual problem. So, in other words, the organization, and as much as organizations should, and many are taking their digital transformation seriously in many aspects of their business, they need to think about board governance as part of that digital transformation journey, and therefore need to support the board members themselves and also support the system to enable uh, the digital transformation of governance. So absolutely, I think it's a system-wide issue and not a, and when I talk about the system, I'm answering your question at an organizational level and not just the, the domain of each individual director arriving at their own pace. Yep, agreed. Thank you. Thanks, Morris, for that. Um, I'm going to ask ask Neo. Neo, you have your hand up as well. If if you would like to ask your question to the panel, if we can uh, just get uh, Neo unmuted. There you go. Neo, if you, Neo, if you can just unmute. Okay, we'll come back to Neo a bit later. Um, let me just go back to the, let me go back to the Q&A. Um, so there was, just back to um, collective responsibility, and this is from Joy Marie, uh, collective responsibility versus individual responsibility as directors uh, in respect to the business judgment rule. As a board, we act collectively in making decisions and yes, applying the business judgment rule but individually we are responsible for how we exercise our judgment. When a board is held accountable, how is this distinguished? Mike? Can you just read that again? I'm not sure that we haven't addressed that. Um, so collective responsibility versus individual responsibility as directors in respect to the business judgment rule. 
as a board, we act collectively, and you, because you spoke about this earlier on in making decisions, and yes, applying uh, business judgment, the business judgment rule, but individually, we're responsible for how we exercise our judgment. So when a board is held accountable, how is this then distinguished, obviously, between the board and then the individual? Well, if we, you don't sue the board. You would sue all of the directors that comprise the board. And by default, there's joint and several liability. But as ANSI said, you have to be able to prove the principles that are necessary to have a director held liable, that there's been a breach, a failure, and there is provision in the Act for directors to be released from that, that net where you, the court is satisfied on application that they were not part of the default of the process which resulted in the negligence or default. So you never sue the board. It, the, di the directors collectively constitute something called the board. So when we refer to the board, we are referring to the directors collectively, the people that make up the board. So you wouldn't see on a summons the board off. You would see the individual names of the directors. You would have to find that each of those directors has breached their duties, failed in their obligations to be able to sue them either individually or jointly and severally those that are liable. Thanks, Mark, very much. Um, Ansi, from Osman, um, Osman says here, integrity is very sorry, broad. Uh, Anton, before you move off from that point, I'm oh, sorry to disrupt. No so problem. I think for me, it's about proof points in answering the, the, uh, the question at a practical level. One proof point is not all directors are made equally. Some are actually lazy and they, they don't deserve the protection of the business judgment rule. So how do you, what do you do to gain the protection of business judgment rule? Read your board pack, not as a novel, but for understanding, all right? And read it deeply for understanding. And if you don't understand, follow Michael's suggestions of get help to understand, all right? To demonstrate in your engagement in the meetings that you have read for understanding by making a, a useful contribution. Three, that demonstration is then evidenced by this notion of uh, board member assessments at the end of each year where your fellow board members give a 360 view. And if you have a very good assessment tool, you're able to do your own self-assessment and assessment of others. And through that process, there should be data points, evidencing of saying, no, this is not the kind of director who arrives and just opens the pack at the meeting, or this is not the kind of director who has read superficially. It's not the kind of director who's afraid to have voice. It's not the kind of director who's not afraid who, who doesn't bring their best into this relationship. So I'm saying, think about how can I evidence my competence and my skill and my experience and my diligence and my care at every point. Thanks, Anton. Thanks so much, Morris. Um, yeah, great, great point there. Um, can, can I ask, Nancy, just back up, yeah, Mark? Just move, I'll move off it, won't you? Can Nancy just quickly address the meeting, I think this will be so important at this day on, on the requirement of an assessment of the board annually and how you assess yourself and your other directors and what King recommends, because I think that talks so much to Morris's point. Sure, and so you, are you able to, and then I'm gonna ask, so I, because I've already clicked on the uh, on Osman's question. So while you address uh, that, that particular point, uh, Osman mentions integrity is very broad and seems a common theme at board executive and at a tactical level. Would you mind unpacking this a little bit? Sure. So on the assessment point, the, the, the value of assessment, uh, those of you who sit on boards, you will know that, um, uh, you know, the people sitting around the table are at the apex point of their careers. Um, they are normally uh, very experienced, um, they are knowledgeable, um, and there's a lot of um, ego 
in boardrooms. And for that reason, it's sometimes really difficult to address performance issues. And as you said, Morris, there are performance issues um, in boards like in any other sphere of, of um, the corporate world. So a, a board assessment and, and the methodology that you use for the board assessment is a very useful tool in unearthing um, these um, non-performance issues in a, in, in a, a more non-confrontational way. Um, it helps the chair to hold the board to account. Um, uh, um, I think as far as the board collectively is concerned, it's, uh, that is easier for the chair to deal with uh, because there will be areas if you use the traditional survey method that, uh, of assessment, which is supplemented with um, interviews. Um, it does unearth collective issues that need to be addressed, um, but then um, I think we must also not be neglectful of the use of um, um, a peer review in where we review the, our peers around the, the boardroom table. And it sometimes takes courage to actually um, point out, you know, non-preparation and not making a proper contribution, etc. But it has to be done because um, if not everybody around the boardroom table is committed and diligent. Um, it means that that person is exposing the whole board. Um, and I love your um, um, an analogy, Michael, to the to the boat where one of the directors may be drilling a, a hole, um, or when there is a hole, uh, you know, not all of the directors helping to um, get the water out of the the boat. So yes, um, assessment does play a, uh, an important role. Just on the issue of the integrity. So um, yes, as I said in the beginning, you, you need ethics, honesty, integrity, but you also need to be effective. But I, I don't want you to see these two things as completely se separate. Because can you really say that you're acting ethically if you're not diligent? Um, that means that you are um, uh, you are a um, passenger. Um, is it ethical to be a passenger on a board? No, it's not because you're in breach of your duties. So you have to see this issue of diligence and being ethical, having integrity, being honest. You have to see those things as 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 connected, and and you have to be both. In fact, integrity, if you go back to its true meaning, it means that you are whole. Um, what you say and what you do, there's um, a connection there. That's, that's actually what integrity means. It means who you are at home, who you are in the office, who you are um, um, with your friends, who you are at church, those all connect um, 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 and 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 presents a complete person. So you can't on the one hand say, I'm an ethical, honest person, and then on the other hand say that, or on the other hand, um, be a passenger and then, and then still feel that you can lay claim to the label integrity. It, it does not work like that. Thank you, Anton. Thanks, Ansi. I saw a comment now, I think it was from Kanita saying that um, integrity is, ooh, now I've lost it. Uh, I'll come back to that. <laughs> I think authentic, it's, self authentic self is integrity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Mike, maybe just a, a quick, quick question to you from Marius. Uh, is a director resigning from the board when the company is placed under business rescue acting in the best interests of the company? Certainly not acting in the best interests of the company and it's certainly not acting in the best interests of the director because what you've done, you've already done. It's happened. And you don't undo it when you resign. So a resignation is, should be taken in very, very exceptional circumstances. And as Morris correctly pointed out, with a very full and honest 
explanation and not that I'm retiring to pursue my own new personal interests. Um, so you were a party to it, you were responsible and accountable, be a real person, an authentic person with integrity, stay with the ship until all the passengers are off, stay there to put right what you did wrong. It's in exceptional circumstances that you resign with a full explanation, but otherwise it doesn't help you. In fact, it hinders you. Whilst you're still a director, you have access to all of the books, records and documents. Once you've resigned, you don't. So you could be defending a position and without being able to have reference to any of the source documents. So carefully consider that resignation. Thanks, Mike. Um, maybe a, a quick question here, Ansi, for you um, from Nosisa. Uh, signing of the minutes of a meeting by the chairperson in this era of online meetings could be challenging. Would you sort of advise on this as to how a chairperson should be signing off the minutes during this era? So the signature of the minutes is evidence that um, the minutes um, have been approved. Um, so you can establish that evidence in, in various other ways, but I suppose the quickest or the easiest way to do it, and I, I'll certainly I deal with it um, um, in my boards, is that um, I sign it electronically um, on my iPad with my iPen. Um, you don't need to have an iPad and an, uh, an Apple pen to do that. You, you can sign um, uh, PDF documents electronically on your machine. I think that's the, if, if I have to be pragmatic about it, that's the, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with also sending an email um, as the chair um, with an attachment um, and, and confirming your approval. Um, although I, I think that trail of evidence can quickly go wrong if your process is not set up for it properly. So I'd rather say signing a PDF document electronically. That's, that's how I would deal with it. Yeah, I think we'd all agree with that. And as you said, it is, you know, technology is becoming such now that um, it's very easy. And if, if you don't have that kind of technology, have a good chat to the your, your CFO and say, I think you should be given a, an iPad with a pen, so you can get that task done without any problems. Just back to another question from Marius, and, uh, and Marius, if you don't mind, I'm gonna address this to you. Uh, Marius asks that should or can directors when they require a copy of the board packs published on an electronic platform, that board pack application when they resign? Practical experience is that some board pack applications allow board members to add notes so visible to themselves or other directors when using the app or the same app, um, but does not allow downloading data. Companies were unable or unwilling to allow resigning directors to retain board packs. Um, do you have any, uh, Morris, do you have any sort of uh, any answer to that, that question where the company should actually allow that? Maybe, maybe Ansi, you can also back up that, um, that question if you don't mind. Yeah, I don't think this is a legal question. It's a practical question, isn't it? It's a practice. Uh, as the director, you are entitled to the minutes of uh, and packs of documents in law where you are part of that. And, and uh, I think they, though if you are part of a company which is not allowing you giving access to those documents and the ability to evidence what you've done, uh, you need to take legal advice to get them to give you access to those documentation. I have not had a personal experience where I've not been given access to uh, uh, packs which historically were in an online format, they do forward those packs and minutes. And in fact, one step further, when I join a board, I ask for minutes, historical minutes, to do an assessment before uh, to before they make an announcement, so that I can say, hang on, what other issues as part of my due diligence might arise from this. Uh, um, from me being a member of this board. So it's not only when I've been a member of the board, but even historically, so I can do a proper assessment. So I think, Marius, in your case, you might have unique circumstances which should be addressed either 
practically. And if the people don't want to play ball, get your lawyers involved. Thank you. Anton, if I can just add something to that. I think in today's sure, world, one should be encouraged to have digital access to the PAC and as Morris says, to all the documents. And I know that uh, in addressing the board of one of the banks recently, um, I recommended to them that the PACs of all of the subcommittees should be on that portal and that the directors of the main board should have access to the subcommittee board PACs and the minutes of those meetings to be fully informed at the main board meeting, remembering always that the board delegates to those subcommittees, it doesn't abdicate, and the board remains accountable and responsible. So the board should be aware of the, what the contents of the board pack and the resolutions of all of the subcommittees, and they should be available electronically with the ability to download subject to all of the necessary security protections so that the director's fully informed in the board meeting, bearing in mind that he or she is accountable and responsible for what happened at the subcommittee meeting. Thanks, Mark. Uh, great point. Um, um, Ansi, do you want to add anything to that or can we move on to the next, next question? No? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I don't know if we can unmute Ibrahim. There's one last, uh, one last hand up. I believe the questions remaining in the um, in the Q and A have been answered. Uh, so what I will do after we've we've uh, heard from Ibrahim uh, is go to each panelist just for your one minute concluding remarks, and then we will close this this session. So th thank you. My my question has been uh, uh, answered. It has to do with uh, group structures. Uh, so I'm I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks, Ibrahim. I'm going to go to each panelist now uh, and just ask them for a one-minute um, one minute wrap up. And I'm going to start, Ansi, with, with you, if you don't mind, and then to Mike and then to Morris. Anton, I'll be very short. And um, um, my advice to a director is that you really make the requirements of the business judgment rule your own not necessarily because you anticipate legal action against yourself or the board that you're sitting on, but because it is such a useful guide um, for executing your duties with diligence. If you are able to follow, um, if, if you are able to use the, the conditions in the business judgment rule as, as, checks on whether you've been acting a diligent, um, I, I think you will do a good job as a director. And I'm not here only talking about directors of companies. Um, I'm also talking about other organizations where you have governance responsibilities. The business judgment rule may not be legally applicable to you, but it's an extremely useful guide for checking your actions as, as a person charged with governance duties. Thanks, Ansi. Uh, Mike? Um, I'm, I'll be as quick as I can. I just want to quickly share a story which I hope will resonate with those who are with us today. It follows on what Ansi said. I did a presentation on the business judgment rule to the board of a big listed company, and one of the directors phoned me afterwards. Uh, he said, you know, Michael, you told us that we must make it part of our DNA, that in that Gladwell blink moment that we should always be acting in accordance. He said, I just want to share with you that I took it into the family. When we sit around the table at the family table and we talk, we now, before we say something to the family, we have to know that we are properly informed about the matter. It isn't just something we heard in the playground or just found on Google. If anybody around the table has a personal interest in what they're saying and it's not in the family's interest, they must disclose the interest. And we always have to see that what we are doing is always in the best interests of the family. 
So he said, I'm going to suggest to you that the business judgment rule becomes a life judgment rule, that the business judgment rule is, applies as much around the table at home for the family as it does around the table in the organization for the board. Thank you so much to all of you for giving me this opportunity. I enjoyed very much the time. Always wonderful to listen to ANSI. And I just want to commend Morris. That was, we spoke about the integrity and authenticity and all of that. And Morris, you shared that personal journey with us so frankly and openly and honestly. I want to commend you for that. Uh, thank you, Anton, for the opportunity this morning. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, very good points here. Thank you. And then Morris. Thank you. It's very hard to uh, follow Ansi and Michael. So let me try. Uh, please don't assess. <laughs> um, so suppose I, I, I'm a student of history and I love the point that the business judgment, judgment rule is 150 years old. And I think it's important that we remember why it was developed and why it continues to be such an important instrument. It was developed to help directors to balance risk and opportunity. And, and ultimately all these rules, ideas, experiences are really designed not just to keep you out of jail, but also to make sure that you are using good principles to achieve the best interest of your organization by balancing risk and opportunity. And so I encourage you to go forth with that in mind, because in this country, on this continent, we need great businesses, we need great organizations, and the business judgment rule is one of those instruments that is going to help us to achieve that. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Morris. And maybe my, my closing comment really is, is that um, you know, decisions taken by, by directors should not be based solely on the manner in which that decision turned out. But as you've all heard this morning, those, they need to be based on the process that the directors followed in arriving at that, at that decision. And uh, I just want to thank the panelists very much. Um, it's been a really great session, great practical insights, good technical, technical insights as well. Um, so thank the, th uh, thank the three of you very much. I'm going to hand over to Vicky to do the formal close. Thank you. You see me? No, not yet. Thanks, Anton. I think you also wanted to mention... Um, you also wanted to mention um, the upcoming papers from the forum. Um, to look out for, which is our 2021 key governance issues. Uh, we're updating the dissenting director paper that was mentioned earlier, and we've got a board culture and digital governance paper that's in the works. Um, so look out for that. Um, from my side, um, it's just a, a grateful thank you to our panelists this morning for joining us. If I look at the chat uh, group, um, the praises of how great the session was. It's just streaming in. I think it was very insightful and very practical. Um, so a wonderful um, session to hear, especially uh, Morris's uh, real life experiences, I think has brought the topic to, to life. So thank you for joining us this morning, Anton, Morris, Ansi, and Michael. And to our members, thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing all of you again next week. Mm -hmm.